Hi there, my name is Kirk White. I first became involved with Dr. Clark's work about 10 years ago. Uh, somebody handed me one of her books and said, The Cure for All Diseases. I thought, gee, that's a pretty bold statement. I don't think so. But after studying the book for some months, I decided it was really good information. There's a lot of science in it anybody could use. She says that if you put deodorant under your arm, in two minutes you can find aluminum in your brain. And if you put deodorant under your arm, in two minutes you can find propyl alcohol in your liver with a little device she invented that she calls a synchrometer. It's made with Radio Shack parts, about $60 worth of parts. The book is uh, an incredible piece of information and uh, really worth reading. And thank you for buying the book you bought. Uh, I, I worked with Dr. Clark now about five years as an understudy, as an unpaid understudy. And I find it's most fascinating. She's without question one of the most brilliant minds on the planet. Uh, I hope you enjoy the video and I hope you can uh, gain a lot of information for yourself and maybe you can save a life. Thank you so much. By the way, Dr. Clark says you can copy this and give it to as many friends as you like. Uh, it may save a lot of lives. Thank you. Morning, Dr. Clark. How are you? Good morning. Fine. <laughs> uh, so this does look for all the world like a worm, if only I had never seen one like this before. And uh, without staining it, you can't um, get a better idea. But it has to be the plant or animal. So uh, I first thing that I would check for is plant food residue, in other words. Uh -huh. And if anything, it could come from, uh, say, uh, um, a banana or plantain, which we use in our diet. So that would be the first thing I would test. And mm -hmm. use a banana, so I would test that first. And that's it. What do you know? That, that was a positive indication mm -hmm. from the synchrometer. Usually it doesn't go that fast because I, I, I have to guess what the possibilities are. I can't go through a long list. Uh, maybe sometime in the future that, that can be done. The, the circuitry is already available to where I wouldn't have to have the actual item uh, for testing. Um, but uh, I'm still at the manual stage and I prefer it that way. But actually, you could have made a, a water copy of that. Yes, I could and, have. Yeah. <clears throat> and also, uh, it would distinguish between uh, banana and plantains. or, or uh, So it, it has very acute sensitivity to differences, little differences. Mm -hmm. Now, if you weren't so, so conscious of all of the things going on and so adept at figuring out what something might be, first knowing the food and the patients, <clears throat> what else would you have checked for that? Uh, if I, if it, <coughs> I couldn't find uh, it to be a food residue, I would uh, go through all my parasite collection. I, I have about 50 or 60 parasites, and I would go through them even if it didn't look like it because, um, well, that's just my procedure in order not to miss anything. And I have those on slides, like slides like this, microscope slides. So if this has uh, a parasite on it or part of, part of a parasite, uh, it would be positive if, that was, if it was that parasite. Certainly, yeah. Well, that's a phenomenal approach. and. Uh it's interesting how someone can take uh, a totally unknown substance in a matter of minutes, determine whether it's plant or animal, and then go right down the chain of parasites and determine what parasite it would be. There are errors you do have to look out for because nothing comes from the toilet bowl purely clean and <laughs> uncontaminated with other parasites. Uh -huh. So that's something to watch for and to, we, we need to clean this up, but this was, I think, this is already in formaldehyde, isn't it? Yes, it is. And so yeah. it has been cleaned up because right. it looked so much like a parasite that 
it was worth doing that cleanup. And actually with that sample you might be able to determine if asterisk was in the system of the patient? Yes. Because it would perhaps be attached or be involved there? Uh, yes, you could. Even, even mm -hmm. Fasciolopsis busky or mm -hmm. some yes. of the other parasites? Yes, you could do that. <laughs> yes. At any rate, I think that's a worthwhile experiment. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Hello there again. Hello. Hey, I, I just love to come in and interrupt you when you're doing things and stick a camera in your face and say, hey, what are you doing, you know? And uh, I had to leave a moment ago because I'd been fooling with formaldehyde and didn't have any voice left. Well, what is it, what's the attitude for formaldehyde, just stuff, if you happen to Sustain know? and taurine. Sustain and taurine? Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. Very interesting. So interesting. you would take maybe one capsule <clears throat> of either one <clears throat> or both. Uh-huh. Interesting. Well, I drank some it's water. It's quite and bad it just, for you. Yeah. <laughs> Certainly yeah. for lungs. Yeah. Well, that was interesting just to... I have to remember now not to prepare things with formaldehyde before I try to talk. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, uh, and a person shouldn't mm -hmm. have any open formaldehyde in the house. Of course, we yeah. have it all the time in other forms. It's a standard air pollutant that we test for. Uh -huh. It's in my set of air pollutants that we test for mm -hmm. um, because there's formaldehyde in foam bedding, formaldehyde in your new clothing that has, if it has never been washed or dry cleaned, mm -hmm. uh, and formaldehyde coming maybe from your cupboards if they're mm -hmm. new wood, some kind of paneling. So the glue that they would use on the paneling and Possibly. the glue they lose the use to put the tile down the back of carpets uh, the, the list Maybe. would I don't, perhaps I don't go know on. All the all the places, but uh, yeah. but people with with lung cancer usually have an excessive amount of uh, of lung uh, of air pollutants uh -huh. that that bother the lung, cause the lung to be inflamed. Mm -hmm. Including radon, including vanadium yes. from the gas stove, and yes. radon from the earth. And yes. Well, tell That's me what you're doing here. What? Uh, the, uh, we have um, a patient with a with a uh, cancer in two places, uh, which is uh, so unusual uh, to have a cancer occurring on the face and in the lower abdomen, and, and nowhere else. I thought this must be coming from her teeth, but she has full dentures, and uh, that would then be a surprise, since it's not uh, coming from uh, tooth fillings. So I'm checking her dentures to see if they're radioactive. Uh, and you can see what I'm testing for. This is just the name of the, the person. I have them in a little bit of well water or any kind of water because uh, even if the water might have some copper or lead in it from the water pipes, that's not going to disturb the test. I'm not looking for copper or lead. I'm looking for polonium, which is the radioactive element causing cancer, but it's not the only thing the, the polonium is complex to cerium, cerium being a lanthanide. But radioactive things from the earth, uh, uh, mainly the radon series, and other things coming up from the uranium down below uh, the earth, uh, those things react with each other. The lanthanides and the radioactive elements come up in, in the same space because they come up from the uranium rocks that are under the surface of the earth. And polonium and cerium are extremely reactive and they, re they react with each other immediately so that you get this little polonium-cerium complex. And you'll see that here I'm testing for polonium um, in this uh, denture that's in a little bit of water in a plastic bag. And of course, there are two entities there, the teeth themselves and the, the rest of the, the pink part of the denture. And I'm just soaking the whole thing to see if that might be a source of her 
carcinogen. There it is, very high. Uh, it's seeping polonium. And I'll look for cerium because cerium is used in dental plastic. You can find that right on the internet. Uh, it's terrible that a great deal of research on cerium was done in the first half century, in the last century already. Cerium came into use and they never did uh, search for an effect uh, that might be contributing to cancer, I suppose. Um, because I find it in every cancer case, it's part of the carcinogen causing the cancer. Part, so part of the I'm complex. Yes. <clears throat> part of the complex between the polonium yes. and cerium. Yes. The carcinogen isn't a single entity. It's a oh. large complex. Uh -huh. and, the, and it starts with polonium, and that is complex to cerium. Yes, we would expect, this is cerium, we would expect it to be exuding it because it's plastic. It plastic enough, it would not diffuse out. But that generally isn't done. It's only hardened for the sake of its physical um, durability and uh, instead of how much it diffuses out. And if you were to harden it the normal way by putting it in a pan of water and the cool water and letting it build up to the bubble point but not boil, would that uh, solidify the plastic sufficient yes. to keep the radiation from coming out? No, but it would keep <clears throat> the cerium from coming out. Uh huh. Um, but it would not keep the polonium from having its action. So these dentures then must be replaced yes. with, with non-polluted yes. denture material. Yeah. The reason this got <clears throat> polluted is because they were using Clorox bleach in the dental supplies. And that's what I would test next. First, let me see if the if if the polonium diffusing out and the cerium diffusing out are already complex. It takes only seconds for that to happen, just as though it was say hydrogen and oxygen or sodium and chlorine. If they came in contact with each other, they would react immediately. And it's, this goes very fast too. There's the complex complete ready to form the complete carcinogen. The complete carcinogen, you have to add the rest of the, uh, of the whole complex. And that comes from Clorox bleach too. The, the ferrocyanide would be found in the Clorox bleach. In the NSF bleach, which we always uh, consider the good bleach or the better bleach, has ferricyanide. It's also very harmful, of course. Any cyanide that you're eating that's, that isn't a plant, plant material, has to be detoxified by the body in a special way, which is quite a drain on the body's resources. The body needs its resources to detoxify the natural uh, uh, cyanide-containing food. About half of our food has cyanide molecules in it, and that's why they're called cyanogens, but they're not toxic, whereas something that's human-made is much more likely to be toxic and certainly these cyanides that are added to the water to keep the pipes from developing scale and from corroding uh, is very toxic. No matter what the literature says, uh, the literature goes back many years and maybe it just ought to be repeated. Uh, the experiments on these cyanides called ferricyanide and ferrocyanide were done a oh, hundred years ago already. And they came to the conclusion that they were not very toxic. That doesn't mean enough. <clears throat> but if it's in your mouth, that's a whole different story. Yes. And if you're a cancer patient yes. that can't detoxify these yes, things, then you're exactly. really in trouble. Right. One of the mutations <clears throat> that this big carcinogen makes besides the cancer mutations, is, uh, is that no rodanese will be made. That is one of the mutations that, the, that this mutagen, a carcinogen is a mutagen at the same time. A carcinogen that can cause cancer is also causing mutations, so that makes it a mut mut mutagen also. So here we will see whether the, the entity from uh, Clorox bleach, which is ferrocyanide, this 
substances, potassium ferrocyanide, whether that is exuding from this denture and diffusing into the body. Yes, large amounts. So now you have the third item that is in the carcinogen. It forms a, a, a chain. Uh, these are the first three members. Uh, the next item is an alkylating agent um, derived from onions, garlic, mustard, and we have synthetic alkylating agents too that are used as chemotherapy because they are so deadly. But uh, ordinary onions, garlic, and mustard make them too. We're not meant to eat much of that, if any. <laughs> now the literature will gloss over that and say, you don't need to worry uh, that this might be coming from the mustard you're eating or the garlic. Th those things have their good uh, attributes too. But this is much more important and um, I think we should be stop we should stop using those foods because we make these alkylating agents from them. And here are here are a few. Here's here's mustard. You wouldn't expect that from an inanimate thing, of course. The alkylating agent it doesn't come from the Clorox bleach. It mm -hmm. comes from the food you eat. Uh huh. No, I was confused. Was that positive or negative? I didn't listen. Negative. That was negative. Okay. Here is dialosulfide that. Uh, would come from onions, and you wouldn't expect that to come from uh, uh, a non-living thing. Here's uh, here's aloe aloe alcohol, another okay. onion-like compound. There oh. are very many alkylating agents coming from these three kinds of foods, and they form oh. part of the carcinogen. It's the next part. Uh huh. So and you, and you you're checking. That. And you're checking an inanimate thing, the the dentures, just. Yes. And you wouldn't normally check for that because you know it's not there because it's not right. a food item. Right. I but see. For yeah. sake of demonstration. <clears throat> right. 